thing. And everybody knows this. That's the problem. Everybody knows this. Even the people who write these books, Marx himself, who didn't really do much working, but a lot of postulating and theorizing. Hey, everybody, welcome to a special episode of Contra Thoughts. I've got Vody Bakum's book. I'm doing chapter eight solo today. Uh, next week, I will have a special guest for chapter nine. So stay tuned for that. But we are looking at chapter eight. I've got some um, Bucky's, if you know that. Drop a comment. Let me know. Uh, it's a famous place in a famous state. But I've uh, got a mocha here. It's kind of cold where I'm at. I'm in my slowly renovating attic space office. Um, I've got the floor done. It was like half finished. So I had to finish it and, and do some other stuff, kind of a learning curve. And I'm going to do the walls and insulation right now. I'm, I'm still testing out the uh, area overall. And I think it's good. So I think it's good. I think it's great. I think it's the best ever. No, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> sound like Donald Trump. All right. So we are doing chapter eight. Hope you're following along. Um, delayed this week a little bit. As I said, I've been doing a lot of things. And um, anyway, get right into it. Okay. There is a reason. San Francisco's Transamerica Pyramid suffered no significant damage in the 7.1 magnitude quake in 1989. Whereas he talks as the first page, 151, about a quake in Haiti, 7.0 in 2010. So 20 plus years later, right? That toppled 100,000 structures. Pretty fascinating. <clears throat> but there's a lot of worldview implications of the worldview of, of most Haitians. Uh, and at least what the biblical principles were established uh, in the uh, United States. But the fact remains, there was no real good at all earthquaking, earthquake resistant no building codes really almost existent at all in Haiti. And you have 100,000 buildings done, toppled. And yet in the skyscraper in San Francisco, 20 plus years before, no problems at all. His point is to be prepared for the earthquake because there is an earthquake coming. And that's something we can at least uh, trust as much as we don't want it. There will be an earthquake. There will be a massive shift. Um, that I don't want to be doom and gloom. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it will happen. I don't know what it'll look like, but it will happen because there's such a faction, such a, such a crack in the crust of the culture of the church that it's going to happen. It's just, it's just going to, and that's really what Vody Bakum's saying. Not that it is, he's preventing it or anything like that. He, he's convinced too, that it's going to happen. And he's got a lot more experience than, I. This is a pretty big chapter. It's called The Damage. It's over 25 pages. Um, he goes through quite a bit of things. He hits on um, family, fatherlessness, quotes Obama quite a bit in, from 2008, 2012, especially 2008 in his campaign. And, you know, most, most people then didn't have anything didn't even know about critical theory or critical race theory, intersectionality, anything like that. Uh, it's been a discipline for, you know, a few decades now, uh, if you want to call it a discipline. And yet most people don't know about it, right? There's a lot of weird disciplines out there that get backing from XYZ media or a politician or just kind of political action group. And then they get steam and kind of like, going downhill, they go faster and faster and faster. He mentions Robin D'Angelo and her interesting points, Thomas Sowell and his interesting points. But right on page 152 into 153, talks about disparities and something that's something most people don't really pay attention to. They think, well, you know, there's less women who make this much money, right? Or if you have more melanin, therefore, you're going to make less money. Therefore, that's racist. But outcome doesn't necessarily correlate to what's actually happening, 
right? So disparities happen, but that's because people generally work hard. Now, it's also because the world isn't perfect. And that's the thing that I want us to pay attention to is that we all have an eschatology, right? A belief about the end, right? Uh, eschaton, that just means end. And ology, of course, study. And we all believe something about the end, about tomorrow. We also believe something about now and, of course, the past. That would be, you know, like origins. Um, and so everybody has a worldview. Everybody has a bias. Everybody has an idea about X, Y, Z, who we should vote for, how we should eat, you know, how we should practice our uh, love life, how we should parent, how we should work, and all these things that animate us as human beings. Now, the Christian should always use the scripture, right? The gospel of redeeming sinners, God, the creator, redeeming lost sinners through himself and unto himself, right? Because no one else could do it, right? I just saw this, uh, it's an atheist meme shirt. I don't know if you saw my, I posted a little goofy short, one of those shorts. I don't know who sees those or not. It's kind of weird, but uh, it was, it was a, atheist and it was like an acronym spelled out blah 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 critical thinker i don't know whatever and i saw another one that was like what did i say something about worship a god who wants me to worship him and redeemed himself from himself for me or it was just kind of some nonsensical straw man and it's like well but yeah you can't save yourself Right? Because if God isn't God, if he doesn't, if he isn't the creator, if there is no creator, then there's no rules. And that's what we've seen a better part of 300 years with the Enlightenment and all sorts of Western philosophy, even Eastern philosophy to a degree, that if there is no law giver, there's no law, there's no law giver, therefore I just do whatever I want. And that is what we are seeing full well on full display today. So, that being said, the world has fallen, right? And we can see that and we understand that. And that's what he's talking about briefly. And that a lot of critical race theorists, uh, experts, social justice warriors, whatever you want to call them, see that. And listen, I'm going to applaud you. Hey, there's an issue. There's been racism in the past. There's racism now. How do we deal with this? Yeah, I, I agree. Absolutely. No one, I don't think, you know, there are probably a few, but most people don't say there is no problem, right? There is no discrimination. There is no racism. Bodie Bauckham's not saying that. I'm not saying that. Nobody that I've had on my, on my show uh, doing this series has said that or thought that. I don't think maybe they've thought it, but they've not said it. The question is why? Why are we like that? Why is there an issue? That's the question. And then how do we deal with it is the second question, right? Because this is where the church needs to unhitch and ignore and radically then fight against critical theory, at least ignore it, but more specifically fight against it because it is completely antithetical to the gospel. Now I have I've had some people comment, uh, one guy in particular, his name doesn't matter, uh, said, you know, I don't know why people are so upset about it, Christians, blah, blah, blah. It's, you know, CRT lines up with everything in the Bible, or the Bible lines up with everything in CRT. And it's like, yeah, it doesn't, though, at all. Like, not even close. And if you've read the book, which I would bet he hasn't, and if he has, he's read probably a chapter and then an article about it and decrying it as, you know, nonsense or whatever. But the gospel, the scripture, is God saving sinners. We're in a horrible place. We're all equal under the law. We're all sinners. We're all fallen short of God's glory, men and women, boys and girls. And we're all stuck. We can't earn our way to God. Now, he has made a way and provided a way for us to be redeemed by the blood of the Lamb of God. But that must happen through faith in him. And you can read the gospel accounts and you can see how the church gathered forms and teaches and further teaching uh, is further defined, as it were, not created, but defined and refined uh, over the centuries. But the 
gospel, the Christian church, is all about sinners understanding their sin. Because that's the problem. Human pride, men and women, boys and girls, are prideful. We are very proud. And in one sense, it's good to be, you know, I want to be proud of my country or proud of my team or proud of my family. I'm proud of my son. Oh, I'm proud of my daughter. You know, okay, not the same type of pride. The pride is I can do this on my own. I can get my life together on my own. And that's where a lot of these people know the Robin DiAngelo's and, and um, Delgado's and even others who are, who are stated uh, in this chapter and the next chapter, especially uh, even Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton from yesteryear. They're still around, but they're totally irrelevant in my estimation. Um, they've been eclipsed by BLM. They see there's a problem, but the question is, why is there a problem? Well, because we're all fallen short of God's glory. Because sin infects the creation. In fact, we see this all the way back in the early pages of Genesis. This is why we have to have a good understanding of the first pages of the Bible. Genesis is needing to be understood. But when you reject it, like somebody like Tim Keller, uh, or you start to bring in millions and billions of years and materialistic evolution, and somehow God used that, that's called theistic evolution. Uh, we see, especially in the next chapter, that Tim Keller, he's really soft on a lot of other things. Right. And then you become soft. If you don't have a real Adam, Romans five is pointless because you don't have a first Adam. You don't have really a second Adam or a need for a second Adam. And therefore, there's no actual redemption and we are still lost in our sin. Or maybe sin doesn't really exist and it's just a social construct. But then how do we deal with this? Oh, they have an idea. The critical race theorists have an idea. They want us to pay penance. They want us to work. And this is where we see most cults and false religions go out. That's what they do. You have to work off your things. And who decides the work? Well, me, because I've got the most power. And that's what they want to do. I mean, it's evident. And if you don't see that, you're not paying attention. Jamar Tisby and Ibram X. Kendi, especially Kendi, that's what he's talking about. You got to do the work. Do the work of anti-racism, not just being not racist. It's not enough. You have to be against it. Well, of course, who's not against racism? Like, I'm sure there's some people that are still closet racist. Okay. Well, that's heinous and wrong because we're all made in God's image. But see, the other problem is most of these people believe in materialistic Darwinism, which says we're not made in God's image. And there's different individual trees, family trees. There's, you know, the, the, the group that came from Africa, the group that came from Indo-Europe, the group from came from Asia and so on. There's different evolutionary trees that branch out, but that's not what the Bible says at all. Nowhere. Don't even try and marry it. Doesn't work. It's wrong. We are made in God's image, right? And as a Christian, and if you're not a Christian, bow the knee, turn to Christ. He will take you. Uh, it's far better than your the alternative, I promise you. But if you are, you know that this is true. You know that, yeah, we've got this skin deep mentality. And yes, there's, sure, there's things that happen with culture and with food preferences and languages and where we grow up, birth order that you can't control, your parents you can't control, the issue that you, you know, when you were however old and some tragedy struck your family. You can't control any of that. That shapes you. But that doesn't automatically mean that you're a victim all the time and this other person's always an oppressor all the time. But that's what they want to do. They want to simplify it because they want to control you. Thomas Sowell is very good. He's 90. I would encourage you to reach, read, uh, read him. He's not a believer, but a very good example of just common grace and wisdom that comes from him. I have some Bucky's. It's not really from Bucky's, though. I'm in Kentucky. I'm not in Texas. Homemade. Anyway, um, Discrimination Disparities. It's a book he wrote in 2018. He's talking about the outcome, right? When you have a meritocracy, merit, and you're working, and this is what's so weird is the CRT people want the oppressors to work and the oppressed to kind of sit back and just like, you know, take in all the benefits because they've been so harassed, even though most people like Oprah and LeBron James and many others have never been harassed, at least not any time recently. They're very, 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 very wealthy, and therefore they don't have any trouble <laughs> at all other than being too wealthy, um, which is ironic because the leftists supposedly hate wealthy people, but you have a bunch of wealthy people on the left. It's kind of weird. But Soul is pointing out that just because you work hard doesn't mean it always happens this way, but at least you have the opportunity. Whereas if you have these artificial things that 
uh, come in with equity, not equality, but equity. Everybody deserves this. This is socialism, right? If you work hard, you shouldn't be able to make $100,000 a year. You should give that money or be restricted and only make 50 because the slouch over there, he doesn't make any money, but he should still get $50,000. So the 50,000 that you're making, you're, you're good with that. You're working hard. And then there's another 50 that we're going to just give to him. Or in this case, in our current climate, just print the money. Yeah, who cares? 154, circular question begging logic. According to the Cato Institute, 62% of Americans say the political climate these days prevents them from saying anything. They believe others, they believe because others might find it offensive. That's 62%. That's not a huge number, but that's almost two thirds. So, I mean, it's still pretty big. And this is sad because we don't have dialogue. That's why something like this is good because you either listen or you turn off. You can't really like yell and interrupt. And if you have a problem, go make a video about it uh, or leave a comment. Let's talk about it. But let's have civil dialogue. We've lost that completely in our culture. And it's not because of Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton or whatever. Like it's been around for years, years and years. It's just shown to the surface. And chapter nine was very much that as well. Just showing kind of the, the bubbling up. We realize, oh no, there's a problem. Donald Trump wasn't the problem. He was a reaction to the problem of people voting for Obama in 2008, 2012, uh, who's the most pro abortion candidate, Marxist claims to be a Christian and yet does all these other, uh, crazy things that are totally anti-biblical, but that's next chapter next week. So tune into that one. The argument goes something like this. Systemic racism is a cause of disparities. If you doubt that it's because you are racist, right? That's page 155. So notice there is a circular reasoning. That's what he just said. You can't, it, it, it's kind of a smart argument if you want to go that route, because ultimately you, you, you can't deny it. Like you have to embrace it. There isn't like a yes or no. You know, you go to the buffet and you're like, I'll have this food or I'm not going to have that and just move on. It's like, no, you have to eat this. And if you don't eat this, this means you're bulimic. This means you hate fat people. This means you're stupid or whatever. And it's like, nah, I just don't want to eat the lasagna. Thanks. I'm good. You know, and this isn't as benign as lasagna, but this is saying that people are racist if they don't see the problem. And if you do see the problem, at least now you're on the right track. So there's no option of disagreement. And this is a straw man argument that they set up two things. And if you know a straw man argument, it's just basically setting up something that your opponent doesn't actually believe and then knocking down that and saying, see, you're wrong. It's tied to it. And this is where people do this all the time. People do this in the church. People do this in the culture. Uh, you know, atheists will do it and they'll say, well, I can't be Christians say I can't be moral. And I, of course I can be moral. I was like, no, I never said that. It's, there's no reason for you to be moral if you're an atheist, because you have no foundation for reality. You just think pond scum is animated by lightning over billions of years. And now you're just kind of this, you know, sentient ape or a brain on a stick that just bounces around for 60, 70, 80 years. And then you go away. You really have no reason to be upset about anything or happy about anything because eat, drink for tomorrow you die. Who cares? Um, so, but a, a straw man is an atheist saying, Christians say this and therefore blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, that's not true. He cites a Portland State University professor. Portland State, by the way, is a very crazy liberal school. It's one of the most liberal schools in the country. And, and that's saying a lot, right? Because there's a ton. And yet Bruce Gilley, Gilly, probably Gilly, G-I-L-L-E-Y, uh, was fired because of it, because of bringing some issues to light with critical race theory. That's crazy. He goes further on page 156, take an imaginary discussion of a young man in trouble with the law who was eventually expelled from school. Could this, could his history of drug use be a contributing factor? <clears throat> Not his fault, it says. Racist policies flood the inner city with drugs. How about his record with poor academic performance and absence from school? The answer, supposedly, inequalities created inferior schools that minorities are unmotivated to attend. Well, then it comes back. Well, could the lack of father in the home be anything to do with it? That is a byproduct of slavery and an excuse used to blame the victim. In the end, the answer to everything is racism, Bauckham says. And he goes through. 
and cites um, Charles Murray book, Human Diversity, talking about equality is really the same as sameness. Uh, I've heard others say, Doug Wilson in particular, kind of the state just thinks we're like a bag, bag of BBs. You know, we're not married. We don't have children. We're not tied to anything. And it can just reach just you know, bony, grimy hand in and just pull out the bag of little BBs as much as they want. Greased BBs, he says. And so they're all very loose. They're all just floating around, not stuck to anything, not tied to any tradition, not tied to a party, not tied to any sort of nationality, not tied to any, uh, you know, I love America. I'm a Christian. I'm a dad. I'm a father. I'm a son. None of that. And they're far more easily able to be dealt with and talked to and influenced and subservient to the state. That's a big deal. <clears throat> he cites soul again glenn lowry both non-believers but both part of the black community who have some issues with uh the critical race theory just in general and this critical social justice then he goes through talking the bat the black pulpit uh which is really good Spends a lot of time in that. I'd encourage you to read that if you have the book, 158, 59, and 60. Read it again. I hope you read or, or at least somewhat following along and uh, read that. <clears throat> but he goes in and he talks about Morehouse College and how um, rather he hits on meritocracy, right? And you have to work hard if you want to achieve something. And everybody knows this. That's the problem. Everybody knows this. Even the people who write these books... Marx himself, who didn't really do much working, but a lot of postulating and theorizing. They're a German guy, but he was in England much of his life uh, with plenty of food and drinking water and um, clothing and safety. And yet it's like, oh, the worker and this and that. It's like, you're not even, you don't even work, bro. Like, who, who are you trying to fool? But apparently you fooled millions of people, or at least hundreds of thousands over the centuries, centuries, the decades, excuse me. <clears throat> But this is part of the legacy of the black community, he goes on. We are a proud people who have always seen the need to strive for education. Note historian Robert Higgs commenting on the astonishing feat of achieving black literacy post-slavery in black America noted for a large population to transform itself from virtually unlettered to more than half literate in 50 years ranks as an accomplishment seldom witnessed in human history. Amen. And I meant, I mean, I seriously, amen and amen, uh, because that matters. But why aren't people talking about that, right? Those who are like, might be watching this and you're like, ah, I don't know though. I mean, I just, I still feel like, you know, CRT might be helpful. Uh, I feel like this is a tool. I feel like this can help us in some way. We didn't have these things when the black community was learning how to read. And now half in 50 years are literate. That's a huge deal that is totally ignored. And yet you have many others who are talking about it but they're not talking about it from the perspective of the black community or in uh, CRT terms because they're, they want an agenda. And then please see that. If nothing else, I want you to see, if you've not already seen it and understood it, that there's a massive agenda at foot. It's not about fairness. Just like the alphabet people, they weren't just wanting marriage. Now they're after your children. We've probably seen that, right? The San Francisco men's choir were after your kids. And of course, they claimed it was just parody or, you know, whatever. But they are. I mean, because it's it's a self-refuting lifestyle to have two dudes because, you know, two dudes can't procreate. Two women can't procreate. Um, <clears throat> they didn't want to just get married. It wasn't just about, you know, oh, those gay people, they're so fun, you know, with shows like um, Friends or Seinfeld and even more explicitly Will and Grace and others. They, oh, that's just a funny gay guy, you know, no big deal. But Hollywood used that for years to soften the American and Western conscience and attitudes towards that lifestyle. I mean, I used to remember when 20 years ago when I was a kid, it was called an alternative lifestyle. Now you don't hear anybody say that, right? It was also just G, uh, GLB, uh, gay, lesbian, and bi. And then they swapped it to put the L first because men and, you know, we want women first. Okay. And then they added the T later on. And now we've got a whole host of letters. I stop at T though. I think you only get like four. Come on. You don't need more letters than an acronym. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> if we really cared about black people, if we really cared about disparities, if, we, if they really cared about the income inequality and, and all this, then 
they would do something as opposed to just spouting nonsense. They're, that's all they do, write books and complain. That's what the grievance studies are all about, women's uh, studies and LGBT queer studies and this and this and this. All it is is about complaining. That's really what it is. It's not about helping people. I mean, how have they helped anyone? Please point out how this has helped anyone. How did Obama in 2008, from 2008 to 2016, how did he help? How did Baltimore or Detroit or, or New York or Philadelphia, Chicago, or even Seattle and Portland, some of these other more mixed cities, but those predominantly ones uh, that I mentioned, predominantly black. And yet they have more homicides, more crimes, more violent acts. And yet they had all, everybody more or less was black. You know, the mayors and the police chiefs and this and this and this. And yet what happens? Oh, take the guns away from people. The, the, the people who obey the law. But those who don't, I mean, again, criminals don't care about laws. That's why they're criminals. So sorry, you know, Mayor Lightfoot, who's a total clown with her, especially with her haircut. And I just, I'll tell you, what are you doing, lady? But Chicago is a mess and it's been a mess. And if you want to pay attention at all, just look up on a Monday, how many murders were over the weekend in Chicago. And yet they have the most strict gun control laws ever. And how is, how is that helpful? How is Lori Lightfoot helping anybody? much less her own quote unquote people. Because after all, she's going to believe some CRT lie that, you know, we're all in this together. No, we're not. No, you're not. You have armed bodyguards. You sit behind plate glass. You've got, you know, probably two or $300,000 a year job salary. You don't even do anything. You go get your hair cut during the pandemic, right? Like it's just, uh, anyway, it's not so it's crazy. And as a Christian, we must know that people are sinful. We must know that people are corrupt and that matters. And then we have to act accordingly, right? Not a matter of, well, act like you're a Christian. Yeah, it'd be nice if you did. But what you should do, the person who's an unbeliever, should understand that these problems aren't going to go away because sin doesn't go away on its own. It just doesn't. It has to be redeemed by the blood of the lamb. It has to. There's no other way around it. <clears throat> and so because of that, take a note here, because of that, we then have to look and say, okay, so this doesn't work. And how have these things helped anybody? How did it help anybody? Personal responsibility is now racist, right? Huh? You know, taking, taking consideration for people and saying, you got to work hard. Father's got to stay in the home. And yet now that's racist. Oh, you're blaming the victim. You're blaming the victim. Excuse me? Yes, that, that's terrible. But what about men taking responsibility and women taking responsibility? He goes through crime, feeding the victim mentality. This is on 165. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves on the truth that's not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Quoting there, John 1, uh, 1 John 1. Um, I mean, it, 70% of unwed mothers when 50, 60, 70 years ago, by the way, if you've not, uh, watched uncle Tom, I encourage you to read that or read that, watch that, uh, great documentary, very well done. Um, Candace Owens, Larry Elder, a bunch of other people in it and very, very good. And it shows, and I, I quite believe firmly that. Not only did the Democratic Party start the Ku Klux Klan and moving people, the black community from the plantation to the Democratic Party, but they've lied repeatedly. I mean, if, if, if I was, uh, I just, I don't even, I, I'm not that, so I can't, I can't go there, but I'm not going to believe your lies. I mean, I don't believe most of the Republican lies either. So don't think I'm some GOP shill. The point is that they're routinely lying routinely over and over and over and over and over for years decades oh we'll give you free stuff we'll give you and it's like are they any better are the inner cities any better i don't know i was already ranting on that i'll stop but the point is they've moved from the plantation and there's better quotes than me to the democratic party and 
now we have things like Blexit, I think is what it's called. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, there's another one. I think Blexit is the Black Exit, which is Candace Owens. There's another one. Also, Walk Away Movement and things like that. Because let's be frank here. The Democrats have a horrible, horrible track record, too. And yet they're more firm than the Republicans. The Republicans are kind of like, ah, I mean, okay, we'll, we'll change this. No, we're still against that. And they're kind of like always behind as opposed to standing and saying, no, we're going in a different direction. We're going to go with the Constitution. We're going to go with the Bill of Rights. Democrats could do that too. Another note, and I know I've given, maybe given you some homework. Go find the 1960 presidential platforms for the Democrats and the Republicans and look and read them and see how close they are and how far we've strayed in the last 60 years. 1960. Nixon, Republican, JFK, Democrat, and look at their party platform and just read it and see it and see how much we've changed. Page 165, according to the American Journal of Preventative Medicine, in 2000, for people aged 10 to 34, homicide rates were more than 11 times higher for black people than white people. 11 times. And yet there's only 15, what is it, 15% or so of the whole population of America is black african heritage and yet 11 times higher for people my age and younger are you serious seriously and then it says in 2015 the homicide rate goes goes up to 13 percent Th excuse me 13 times 13 times higher what is it six years after that i have no idea horrible horrible this is astounding and yet blm doesn't care about this they don't address this at all obama didn't address this reverend al sharpton and jesse jackson and all these race baiters and hustlers, J uh, Jamar Tisby and Ibram X. Kendi, they don't address any of this. Now they might mention it in passing, but how are we going to handle this? Personal responsibility. Treating people like you want to be treated. Fathers staying in the home. Don't have free sex with people and just do whatever you want to do. And they're like, well, you, you're always going to go get an abortion. The abortion mills know this. They pry, or excuse me, they, they uh, <clears throat> pry. No, pray. There it is. They prey on people because they think you're stupid if you have melanin. They do. Pay attention. Pay attention, please. Brothers and sisters, pay attention. They think you're stupid. They think I'm stupid. Or they'll just call me racist, which, you know, badge of honor, put it on. I don't care. I'm not racist. Before God, I'm not racist. In an actual sense of like being racist, like animus and hating people. That's what racism is. Showing up on time for work and sticking with the woman who also is the mother of my children. That's not racism. Sorry. That's just normal common sense and biblical decency. <clears throat> and yet he goes through on page 167, Bauckham further and says, according to Federal Bureau of Justice of Statistics, talking too fast, in interracial violence involving blacks and whites, whites perpetrators account for 15% of the cases, while black perpetrators are 85%. So there's not only police brutality, which happens very rarely. Let's be real here. The next chapter deals with abortion head on. So I encourage you to check it out when I do it next week. It's just, it's, I mean, the number is over 2,300 people are killed through abortion every day. And just imagine if 2,300 plus people were killed by gun every single day in this country, whether it was, you know, killings in the streets or the police, military, People would be aghast. People would be freaking either just terrified or freaking out or rioting in the streets. And yet, eh, it's business as usual. It's disgusting. It's abhorrent and it's evil. It's so evil. And then it says further, a police officer is 18 and a half times more likely to be killed by a black assailant than an unarmed black man is to be killed by a cop. And that's Heather McDonald, The War on Cops from 2016 that's before george floyd and all this other stuff now this isn't new and again don't hear well that's wrong brianna taylor out of this yeah that's bad too but don't think well that's bad but all this other stuff that's just whatever don't don't be this duplicitous person or if you're friends with or you know <clears throat> you're related to or co-workers or whatever call these people out oh george floyd though man he was innocent i mean he wasn't innocent though I mean, let's be real here. Not only was he did he have a track record, but he broke into a woman's house and shoved a gun in her belly before that. He's robbing her with other dudes who tricked her to open the door. Not to mention he was probably high and he was trying to palm off, palm off a counterfeit bill. 
not exactly a stellar citizen. Oh, I don't know. That's so harsh. But that's the truth. Are we not? Do we not care about the truth? Because if you get mad about that, you, you're mad about the truth. Okay. You're not mad at me. And I'm not going to listen to the nonsense. Well, oh, you're just being racist. You're just uh, stirring the pot. No. And maybe if you agree with me, fine. But you're not stirring the pot either. If you uh, if you clearly bring up the point that this happened, this is who George Floyd was. He wasn't some lawyer in upstate Ma uh, upstate New York or you know Minneapolis, wherever, practicing law, and the police pulled him over and his BMW yanked him out of the car and just shot him or choked him to death. Not at all. Not at all. In fact, does that happen? I don't know. But if it has happened, we don't haven't heard about it. <sighs> Working myself up. Trayvon Martin. Abdu Ab 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 Ahmad Aubrey. Arbery? There it is. Medgar Evans. Evan Emmett Till. These are people that have been killed. Guys that have been killed. And it's it's heinous. It's bad. These people are dead. They're dead now. Don't hear me that I'm saying, oh, I'm making light of this, or Bauckham's making light of this. No, this is still abhorrent, but it's not the same thing. And the Emmett Till and uh, Medgar Evans Evers were two different guys who were like lynched. Lynching's bad. That's horrible. But that's completely different than somebody breaking the law and the police using excessive force and killing in on, ten, in, on purpose or accidentally a man with more melanin. Because he goes through black on black violence. And so much of this perpetuates from fatherless homes. Women getting pregnant out of wedlock, right? This is why you should get married, have children, stay with your children, stay with the mother of your children. Your life statistically goes a million times better for you, for your children. I mean, again, think about it, just with gangs. If you don't have a job, it's easy to go hang out at all hours of the night, right? If you don't have any responsibilities, if you don't have a wife to come home to, and, you know, especially if you're a believer or you've got some understanding of morality, you're not going to go to every strip club, I hope, and prostitutes and go get high in the middle of the road and just hang out in some car. And you got a job to get up in the morning. I got I to gotta provide for my family. Sorry. See you guys. Have fun. Not going to do it. But when you're free, quote unquote, as the culture tells you to do with through pornography, through drug use, through all sorts of other things, which are all very heinous. And again, the Christian church is stuck in a lot of that which we need to man up and be responsible and say, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to live wholly unto the Lord, even if it's difficult. I'm going to get up early. I'm going to stay up late. I'm going to provide for my family, period. That's what I'm going to do because it will go better for me, for my wife, or for my children. Don't get divorced. Don't. Don't be like the world. Don't be an idiot. But rather be against it. Contramundum, right? Be against the world. Be against its stupid, sinful logic. Don't be captivated by every philosophy and vain deceit, but be captivated by Christ. This 72, 172, um, he talks about Kermit Gosnell. And this is the uh, abortion is the unspoken ap ap epidemic. He talks about it quite a bit in the next chapter as well. The question of life in 172 is the question of the 20th century, said Jesse Jackson in 1978 speech, that is uncharacteristically of his latter stance. Race and poverty are dimensions of the life question, but discussions about abortion have brought the issue into focus in a much sharper way. He concluded the point that he was beliled by his actions, but which nonetheless remain true. How will we respect and understand the nature of life itself is the overriding moral issue, not of the black race, but of the human race. And then he, Bauckham says, I couldn't agree more. That is why I believe the abortion question belongs at the center of the discussion about race and, race and justice, race and justice. Talk about justice, right? Climate justice. Oh, forget about that for a moment. Talk about that another time. Racial justice, racial equality. What about the unborn? They're silent. Because here's the thing. Not only do you have every single culture and religion admitting that when a woman becomes pregnant, She's pregnant. She's got a baby in there. There isn't anything other than a baby. Even in 1973, Roe v. Wade, they didn't have the technology they have now, but it was lied and, and told and even believed uh, with materialistic evolutionary belief that the fetus, so-called, goes through evolutionary processes. Well, it doesn't. The baby might look like a fish, but it's not a fish at that point. It's not. 
everything is there already from conception. There isn't anything added. There isn't any humanity being added or anything else, both physiologically and, of course, spiritually as well. So you can't get around this argument at all. The baby is a baby, period, no matter how small. That's uh, what is that? Horton, her, here's a who. A person's a person, no matter how small. A very good pro life film, although it's unintentionally so. And book, of course, Dr. Seuss. But they can't do this. So this is what they do. They 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 change the subject completely now. Now it's not even you know the right to get an abortion, but the right to end a pregnancy, right? Or or fetal whatever, or this or that. And yet they all know that it's a baby. Kermit Gosnell knows it. He was convicted of, of a couple counts of murder, but he was there for years. Black man in a very pov impoverished neighborhood and would kill babies left and right. Not only the unborn babies, but even born babies. He would snip their, uh, he would snip their spinal cord to kill them. And then he would sell the body parts or he would keep them in jars. This place was filthy. There's rat feces, there's cat dung and poop everywhere unclean to the hilt. Women would die, get seriously ill with infections. People, women in comas, they wouldn't wake up. And finally, Kermit Gosnell, finally, some sort of justice, even though he murdered probably thousands and thousands of babies, is convicted. And of course, God will judge him one day. He will be judged one day. But this man is just, just dripping with pure evil, the most heinous, scaly, putrid, stanky, sulfur-smelling evil, just, just dripping off this man's soul. For him to be so hardened by the deceitfulness of sin is just unheard of. 172, 73, 74 uh, is about him. Bauckham touches on Margaret Sanger, of course, a eugenicist, Avid racist, marched with the Klan, total uh, uh, pale gringo. Like, she hated black people. And yet, then, and this is what they want to do. The human weeds, she calls melanin plus people. <laughs> More melanated, I think. Um, I heard that recently. Because these people are racist. They're the real racist. And the people who are today, they're either carrying water for the racist, the Don Lemons who, you know, sit and make a pretty penny doing absolutely nothing but complaining. He, he, he shouldn't get anything. And he certainly shouldn't lambast people who are against his uh, predecessor, right? Or, or, or uh, the person who's, who's going against abortion, right? You should be for this, man. Margaret Sanger wants to murder you and her allies. Jesse Jackson, Rev Reverend Al Sharpton, Barack Obama. How in the world? But what they're doing is they're using this for power. And that's the big thing. It's all about power. This is 1923, almost 100 years ago, when Planned Parenthood was first started. And yet, the abortion lobby continues to march on. We want it to be not safe, legal, and rare like it was in the 1990s with Bill Clinton in this kind of moderate position. Safe, legal, and rare. No, it is we're killing babies by the truckload, by the busload every single day. But because they don't have faces, they don't have names, it's done in so quiet. And what are we going to do? What is the pro-life Christian going to go do? Firebomb a Planned Parenthood? Yeah, you could stand outside. Yeah, you could try and have witness conversation, which are good. Anyway, it's a heinous, heinous evil. But what's terrible is he goes on in The Damage, this chapter is called, 175, according to the recent Gallup poll, 2001 to 2007, 31% of black Americans thought abortion was morally acceptable, barely a third. But from 2017 to 2020, that rose to 46%, almost half. Non-black voters was 41 to 43%. So the most pro-life, 31% said, yeah, that's fine. But 70, almost 70% say, mm, no, that's wrong. Morally unacceptable. Go from nearly half, 46%. This is Gallup, not a slouch organization. Comparison, non-black voters only saw a two-point change where others, the black community, far higher. And what does he say? You can't...
discount the fact that Obama was president from 2008 to 2012. The most pro-death, let's be real, what it is, the pro most pro-death candidate. Making promises, oh, not a black America, an Asian America, or white America, a United States of America, blah, 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 blah. And yet Obama garnered 95% of the black vote in 93 and 2012. 95 in 2008 and 93 in 2012. He was the most pro-abortion. He goes on further, vigorously opposed the Illinois Born Alive Infant Protection Bill. Opposed it, even if it's born alive. The abortion botched and child born alive. No, you should still kill it. Kermit Gosnell style. Evil, evil, evil. So wicked. And yet that type of bill passed in Congress with not a single opposing vote. But Obama, before being president, opposed it. The most pro-abortion candidate. Not to make this all about Obama, but let's be real here. Are we more united? Or are we more divided? Were we more united in 2016? Before Donald Trump being president? Are we more united now? No, we're, we're, I mean, people say we're the most divided since the Civil War, right before the Civil War. I surely hope we don't have a hot war, a hot Civil War. I really don't. I don't want that. I want people to come to their senses. I want people to quit with the evil. I want people to stop killing babies. I want people to take responsibility for themselves. Don't divorce your wife. Don't go out on her. Women, submit to your husbands, unto the Lord. So on and so forth. Children, obey your parents. This is not hard. And yet Israel, what did they do? Saw the mighty hand of the Lord, his works, his righteousness, and yet routinely... Anyway, I could keep going. Appreciate you watching. Um, drop a comment. Tell me what you thought about this chapter. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week as well on Tuesday uh, at 5 p.m. Central Time. We've got the chapter 9 and then there's chapter 10 and 11. I think there's two more chapters. Uh, so next week I've got a special guest. Uh, he's got a YouTube channel, pretty good, pretty prominent channel. Um, so hopefully... We'll be able to uh, go through that too. So, anyway, until next time, be contramundo, promundo. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. See ya.